Well, welcome to Personal Finance. Uh, obviously, uh, you see my name, Jim Parker. I'll be your instructor uh, for the Personal Finance course. This is kind of the way it's going to run. I will post the lecture uh, in the PowerPoint slides, and then I'll basically talk to the slides via YouTube um, recording, and then put extra material up there um, as we go through it. Pretty good course, though. You should be able to get uh, quite a bit out of it that you should be able to apply um, somewhat in your college career, but but also a lot more in, in life. Uh, you know, they say everybody ends up financially literate, you know, understanding finances by the time they get old. But the problem is, by the time you get old, it's it's too late to put it to work. Um, knowing a bunch about how to save money and not, not how to get into trouble um, isn't nearly as useful when... when uh, you know, time has passed you by. So uh, anyway, um, we'll, we'll talk more about that kind of stuff as we go through the course. Uh, today, we're just going to cover the uh, syllabus. What I'll do is I'll post these videos uh, early in the week, usually on, you know, Sunday, probably Monday. Anyway, once a week, and uh, and I'll run through the syllabus in terms of how the course is going to run. But there'll be, these things will be coming up weekly. So we're going to talk about the syllabus, and we're going to talk about um, the, the textbook. First, in terms of the textbook, don't don't sweat it. Any addition will do. Um, you know that's one smart thing about personal finance is not to waste money on on textbooks that you know instructors write and the rest of that. If an older edition will do, uh, they're quite a bit cheaper. You know how to shop around, get used editions, whatever. In terms of homework, it may make it a little bit more difficult because sometimes the homework problems won't match up exactly. But we can figure it out, and I'll post the uh, the questions, so that will help you out. But you you will need the the textbook, just not a current one. Um, I raise horses, dogs. I've been up here since about 2010. I uh, um, was military for like 23 years, so I did a bunch of business related stuff. Though I, I flew for a while in the military, but in addition to that, I I did a bunch of uh, contracting type stuff and ended up with a PhD so um, I run a farm ranch kind of thing out in uh, the valley now um, jumping big in the pigs again this year I used to raise pigs a lot they're pretty amazing so five little girls you do the math you can end up with quite a few pigs quite quickly if you've got uh, uh, all females um, this little girl was born just a couple months ago one of my dogs got her over in uh, in Budapest in Hungary. They're Hungarian Vizlas. So um, that is, uh, that's a hobby. Anyway, older horse who was born here a few years ago. Uh, like I say, I used to fly. I flew F-15Es also. The airplane I got down below 48. Um, same horse hobby, me riding around. I was running a campground out at my place. The property's pretty good size. It goes the full extent of this thing, but it uh, uh, the campground ended up, it was just sort of a transitional thing to get things kind of under control. And so back when I bought the property, it was kind of a mess, a lot of squatters and stuff like that. And so um, now that those people have kind of been moved aside and I've got a perimeter fence out there, uh, it's, it's worked out. So... Uh, more dogs, pigs, cattle. Right on the river, though, so it's kind of nice. These were another kind of pig I used to have. Tam worse, but... <laughs> my God, these guys, they would get huge and semi-mean and not a good fit with campers and stuff around. Raised some pheasants, but the bird dogs kind of eat the pheasants, so it runs its course. This is... Uh, we used to get a bunch of stuff from the fruit bank um, in terms of stale food to feed to the pigs. And, uh, yeah, they eat quite a bit of bread old birthday cakes whatever so uh mba phd i worked for booz allen for a number of years so i did 23 in the military and then uh about 10 working for booz allen completely soul crushing horrible <laughs> big corporate experience Ugh. yeah not not quite of that kind of that military camaraderie you're looking for just a just a faceless you know stern napalm good paycheck but yeah not not much else to be said for it I did sell real estate just for a little bit, but that's kind of something you got to do full time if you're going to do it. Not something there's, whatever, about three to five percent of the real estate agents 
salespeople sell 95% of the property. The other ones are just kind of people just kind of in it paying fees and anyway it's it's uh if you're gonna do it you got to do it if you're not um anyway i i'm not at that point in my life where i want to uh walk that intensely to uh to do that plus you you meet some <laughs> questionable folks um business stuff that i was doing when in the military i was i was over in europe probably i lived in europe for about 14 years out of my career both flying and afterwards but uh one of the big things I was doing was uh, we came up with the deal to get a bunch of helicopters from uh, some of the Eastern Bloc, what used to be Eastern Bloc nations under the old Soviet thing. Back when they were Soviets, they, they produced those helicopters, and, and now that they're all independent, we were selling those helicopters uh, to some of the uh, um, nations who were operating out of Afghanistan, so it was interesting. My new venture, Connect River Ranch, which I'll probably retitle. I might actually put my own name on it once it's not not kind of as, as sketchy as it had been in the past. So I wanted to get things organized before I did that. But a huge, huge piece of land. So here's the river. Pioneer Peak is basically right there. Very shady. We're End of summer is kind of a drag around here. It will be shaded from uh, Halloween till February 11th, which is a drag. Um, we can go more into that. Um, this is kind of what we're going to talk about tonight in addition to the lecture, but bigger picture, this is what's super important for, for you know, your financial future. And the one big takeaway from this class is understanding the time value of money. You know, there's two kinds of people in life. There, there's people who, who pay interest and people who earn interest. You know, people who finance the rich people's lifestyle and the the people who enjoy that lifestyle and it's up to you you know most of you are young enough at a point where you can choose to be working for somebody else or or enjoying things so um anyway i mean i'm not naive i, I realize you, you you know there is sometimes people are born into wealth and other things but there's ways to to get around that and um but if you don't understand the time value of money if you don't understand certain concepts you're not going to be able to get around that so we'll we'll talk more about this chart here in in a bit um but let me uh jump to to the syllabus real quick i'm trying to escape out of this this is just the same chart but the eight percent and ten percent Okay, I was going to jump to the syllabus, but the, the keyboard doesn't appear to be cooperating. So as long as we're here on this 10% chart, I, I want to kind of illustrate the uh, concept of the time value of money. Let's say, uh, for a lot of you, this wouldn't, wouldn't apply. But the, the guy who drew this up was a old school military guy. So he was used to dealing with guys who, people who might go to work right at age 18, which isn't, you know, that's realistic for somebody in the military. Um, if they started saving their money rather than going out and buying, you know, new cars and snow machines and everything else, um, just how far ahead in life they could be if they managed to put aside a portion of that money. So what this chart, and, and these charts will be, it's just an Excel spreadsheet, but it'll be in the materials and so you can go through it if, if you can't see it all on on the YouTube thing you can you can reference it you know offline but what's happening here is a person is putting away a certain amount of money fifty five hundred dollars per year okay which equates to five hundred dollars a month and then skip in one month so eleven months of five hundred no did I say five hundred fifty five hundred per year out five hundred dollars per month uh, with the exception of, of one month and then after age 50 put it away a little bit more just sixty five hundred so a thousand bucks more but you'll see once you understand time value of money that that this you know putting in more money later uh, it's semi useful but but doesn't have nearly the power of that money that's put away early early on so um, What's going to happen is, is if that person starts putting away that money, it's going to build. And at this point, it's going to build at 
at 10%. So 10% is really not, um, you know, that, that artificial. The, uh, historically, uh, and we're not, we were, we're in historic times right now, but not for the right reasons, but, but the stock market itself has gone up by 10% per year. Um, and that goes back to, you know, the last century, including the Great Depression and the whatever we're calling that thing that happened in 2007, 2008. If you would have just kept your money in, um, you would have overall earned about 10% per year on average. So, you you know, these numbers aren't artificial. So anyway, uh, if you put that money in, started at whatever age, and then at age 65, how much money would you have? And ROI is called, you know, return on investment. So that's all that RA. Cost of delay means, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 18. I, I want to buy all that other stuff. I'm, I'm not going to start saving for retirement till, till I'm in my 40s or something. You, you'll, you'll be able to see how that's not a good decision. And then the other thing that you may not have heard of is a Roth IRA. You may have heard of an individual retirement account. That's an IRA. A Roth IRA is just a special kind of IRA, one in which you pay the uh, taxes on it before you invest it. On a traditional IRA, you um, put the money in there um, and then um, after, after taxes or before taxes. On a Roth IRA, you put it in there. I'm getting this backwards for you. Sorry. Okay. Starting again. Roth IRA, it's after-tax money, right? You've already paid the taxes on it, which means that you will not pay taxes on it when it's withdrawn. On a traditional IRA, it's pre-tax money. So let's say you're making 100 grand a year, you don't wanna pay you know, uh, income tax on all that money, so you go ahead and designate and put, put money in your IRA or your 401k or something like that, and um, that means that you'll be taxed at $80,000 because 20,000 of it is tax deferred. It's tax deferred. It will still be taxed, but not till you're more likely in retirement. We'll go through IRAs and 401ks and all that stuff later. But anyway, big picture is that the money that this person pulls out of the Roth IRA is going to be completely tax free because the taxes were paid on that money before it was deposited on account. So that's pretty positive. So anyway, knowing what you know, you know uh, $5,500 a year, and you know it's gonna be getting interest of 10%, and it's gonna be in there for quite a while, up until age 65, so 40 some years. How much money do you think you'd have? Well, that's what this chart shows you. 5.3 million bucks. So. Granted, we know inflation's you know going to make that a little less valuable, but 5.3 million is still a lot of money, and will still be a lot of money. And the overall return on investment was almost 2,000 percent because it's compounding; it's earning interest on interest. Another concept we'll talk about later. Let's say you waited, you know, you waited till age 40. Um, how much would you have? Well, rather than 5.3 million, because you delayed, it hurts you badly. You've got 600,000 mm, bucks. You're still gonna have to work. You're not gonna be able to get that much money. Uh, so your cost of delay was, was significant. Anyway, so that's a quick thing on, on time value of money. We'll go through it more in other, you know, other lessons, but keep in mind that not only does this work to make you money, this time value of money, but it also cost you money. If you let your credit cards just roll and you have a balance, well, number one, the interest rate you're being charged is going to be way more than 10%. It's probably going to be double that. And all these figures will completely work against you, and that's why you will still be poor if, if you choose to keep a balance going. So... Okay, now we gotta get out of this thing. We're just gonna try it that way. Okay, getting on to the syllabus. That was the class schedule, but let me start at the top. This is already posted in your materials. So right place, fall 23, cell number, email, the text. Again, get the older editions. 
you can read through this. Two exams, midterm and a final. Well, that's kind of annoying to scroll when you're trying to read. Okay, scrolling. Term project, yep. You're probably not going to like this because there's not a whole lot of guidance given on it. I mean, there is, but there's a lot of it because this plan is going to be tailored to your own situation. It's not going to be dictated by me, so you're going to have to put some thought into it, but we've got some time for you to think about that, more about that. Um, more about that. Grading, so midterm, final, homework, project, that term project, lecture. This is just sort of in, in lieu of attendance. Um, I'll send out a video each week, not the lecture video, but just a little separate um, video that kind of goes through the same point I'm talking about. And you just read it and write a sentence. A sentence is fine. You don't even need a paragraph. But anyway, it just sort of shows me that you're, you know, live out there. Because I get a lot of responses from um, uh, athletes or scholarship people, you know, hey, is this student participating? And um, you participating just by answering those video questions allows me to uh, answer that. Class schedule, go figure, here we are, 28th of August. Um, midterm exam, no proctor on the exams. Take proper Thanksgiving, and then on into finals week. So, all this stuff is out there. The obligatory stuff that you can read through at your leisure. Alrighty. So, getting back to the lecture itself. So these charts, go through them. You know, know them, love them, understand them. And, and believe me, it's mind-boggling that, you know, I don't think many of you would have said, oh, it'll probably be about $5.3 million if I put away about $5,000 a year. It just doesn't make a lot of, it's, it's beyond most of our comprehension. But uh, it, it's true, <laughs> and you'll, you'll testify to the fact that it's true. So here's a better, less eye chartish. So you put in, you know, you're at age 18, you put in that 5500 each month year sorry i'm getting my words twisted today this is how much you could have and that was your uh, return on investment and since you started at 18 now I, I realize most of you are like oh man i'm already behind the power curve well to a certain extent i mean but you can see see how it drops down to 3.2 million just by waiting till age 23 that's because that time value of money. You're earning interest on interest. So, you know, if you want to get back on track, you might plus it up a little bit. I mean, you don't need to make this painful for yourself, but, um, you know, $500 a month, if you could go a little more or a little less, but at least you're doing something. Um, anyway, chapter one. So now we're into the textbook. We're talking about a financial plan here. So definition, personal finance. And this really gets into the, what we're gonna be talking about in terms of the term paper. You'll come up with your financial plan. So in that term paper that we'll discuss later, you'll have to address, you know, what you're gonna do about oh, life insurance, what your strategy is for investing and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to give me your personal details. In fact, I don't really want your personal details. But what you need is is a scenario for somebody in a similar situation. And for most of you, since you're not probably involved in your career already, it's just a forecast, just an estimate. So you're just kind of taking a stab of you know, where you're going to be um, when you start getting into your career and start saving money. So you don't have to go and, you know, start from, if you're just in college right now, I mean, your full-time job should be being a student. So you might not be, you know, deep in the finances. You're trying to maybe avoid paying some student loans with your job, but you may not be saving just yet. That's another issue, too. If you get mired in debt from student loans it's definitely going to impact how much you can save. 
because if you're still paying off your student loans in your 30s, you can see that you're way down that Excel spreadsheet and your retirement um, is going to suffer. And also, you know, keep in mind that retirement money can be used for other things before you retire. I've bought several pieces of property um, through um, retirement accounts before I was retirement age, but just to control them because real estate's a good investment and that's where I chose to put some of my money, so all that. Opportunity cost, I've already referred to this, you know. If you choose to go out and buy a new car, a new snow machine, new whatever, and not save, that's what you've done. Everything in life has an opportunity cost, you know, including this class. You know, if you choose to whatever, you know, go through life in, in a certain way, um, it's going to impact your life. You know, if you choose to study rather than go to a movie, you've, you've made a choice. You know, if you choose to smoke cigarettes, whatever i i don't smoke probably one of the reasons i don't smoke is because i'm too friggin cheap my god when you see somebody driving a beater car driving down the road and they're smoking a cigarette it's like wow if you gave up smoking you would you would have a car payment but anyway not here to preach ah uh, how you benefit from understanding personal finance so yep opportunity cost embedded in everything Become a financial advisor. Believe it or not, I mean, there's a lot of jobs in finance. Unfortunately, you know, I've been down, like I said, the Booz Allen path working for somebody else. But if you're actually pretty good at this and you're independent, you can you can advise people without trying to sell them something. That might be pretty rewarding. If you're on commission and you're trying to sell people things they might not be able to afford or maybe not in their best interest, that, that might lead you down that same soul-crushing path. But that's up to you. Components of financial planning. So we'll talk about budgeting and taxing, tax planning. You know, making money is one thing, keeping it is another. Liquidity, liquidity has to do with, with getting access to cash to cover, you know, current liabilities or basically expenses that you have. How to finance large purchases. There's a smart way and not smart ways to do that. Insurance, investing, and, uh, Planning your retirement and estate. So retirement is while you're still alive. Estate is after you left. Budgeting. So forecasting. So well, and coming in that is you know assets and liabilities. So assets are things you actually own, and liabilities things you owe. And then net worth is different. So let's say somebody says they own whatever house. Well, if it's a five hundred thousand dollar home and you, you know, only have 20% equity, only meaning you only have $50,000 of your own money in it and 450000 is carried by a bank note, your net worth is, is not going to be positive. I mean, it doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. Controlling an appreciating asset is a good thing. But um, yeah, your asset in that case would only be 50000 Your liability would be the four hundred fifty. So, but not all liabilities are bad. Not that you guys would be able to do it right now, but I mean, I've got some mortgage loans out there that are like 2.75%. That pff, That's a third of what people are paying now. So, you know, people will say, well, you should be debt free. No way. And with a loan that's at that low of interest rate, um, you know, it makes sense not to pay it off. Whereas a current loan, you would want to. So we'll talk more about that stuff as we go. Different personalities, sometimes it's in relationships to, you know, one person's a spender, one's a saver. If you're single, it's maybe a little bit easier because you're not going to have probably that conflict, but you kind of know who you are. And, you know, obviously we're going to talk about in this class how to be a, a saver, but you don't want to be, you know, sometimes you need to spend money to make money. And sometimes you want to enjoy a little bit of life. So, um, Planning your liquidity, so liquidity is that cash, basically, short-term cash deficiencies. Management, money management, yep. Just keeping enough money. I mean, having tons of cash, especially in a high inflation environment, is not a smart thing, especially when you've got, you know, identity thieves and other people out there trying to take it from you. So having a ton of money in your checking account is, is not a good idea. Um, Certain things are liquid, certain things are not. 
Real estate, for example, not a liquid investment. It takes a long time to work those transactions out and all sorts of things can happen to delay it. Whereas, you know, cash and even crypto is super liquid. But keep in mind, you know, with, with the wisdom of, of, you know, using cash for liquidity, there's not much of a judgment, but the wisdom of using crypto for liquidity is, is key. I mean, right now, I think Bitcoin's at about 26,000 today, which isn't good, you know, it's, and it's a very cyclical asset. So I would be, be very painful to be selling Bitcoin right now with the expectation that it's going to be quite a bit higher in the future. So anyway, uh, liquidity doesn't necessarily address the wisdom of, of buy sell decisions. Credit management. Yep. Yeah, how to obtain credit, how to use credit. So again, not all credit is, is bad. Real estate credit, you know, uh, if you've got an asset that's appreciating faster than the money that it's taking to, to buy it, then that's a smart financial decision. If it's a credit card debt that's getting, you know, at such a rate that there's no way, uh, you know, your basic financial plan needs to incorporate the fact that you can't be carrying account, uh, a balance on your credit cards. You, you investing and, and carrying a balance on your credit card are, those are mutually exclusive things. There's no expectation that your investments are going to do well enough to earn you the amount that you're paying on credit cards. So, money management, credit management. Yep, yep, yep. So, wise use of credit is smart, especially when it comes to real estate or other times. I mean, you have to analyze each activity. Loans. Yep, I mean, college tuition, but again, you don't want to overspend or, you know, have some expectation that's going to be forgiven. I mean, not to get political, but anybody who thought that those things were going to get forgiven um, or whatever, they were kind of dreaming that was, anyway, it's, it's, it's something that the person offering that didn't have the political power to, to, to do legally, so. Anyway, uh, some people went for that. Managing loans, how much can you afford to borrow? How long of loan do you want to take? And obviously you want the best rate. So keep in mind also, you know, I had a friend who just bought a house this week, but uh, their expectation is they're gonna refinance as soon as the rates come down. So not everything stops, but it is gonna be painful until those rates come down. Lender, financing with a loan, da, da, yep. Insurance planning. Some things are legal requirements, you know, to have liability insurance, insurance that protects the person that you, you know, hurt, injure, damage their property. But the question of insuring your own vehicle, that's up to you, if you own the vehicle. If you've got a loan on it, you don't really own the vehicle. Uh, the bank will probably insist upon full insurance. Health insurance, very political. Um, it's health insurance and health costs. It, it kind of goes beyond personal finance now because it's it's kind of the great unknown and it's it's a it's a huge huge problem. We'll talk about some of the things you can you can do to minimize that. But uh, when you look at bankruptcies, for example. Um, the number one driver for that is, is, you know, health costs. And so you can't really look down on somebody who's got a bankruptcy knowing that most of them are caused by, by health claims. And, you know, if I've got a, somebody's dying or even myself or whatever, yeah, spend like there's no tomorrow. And unfortunately, how we got in that situation is, it's got very little to do with, personal finance, but a lot to do with politics. Disability life insurance. There's smart ways to do that as well. Um, and we'll spend some time on that. So, investing. Yep, you need a higher return, especially now. You need a return that's higher than inflation or else you're just wasting your time. Keep in mind, any money you make is gonna be taxed. 
uh, when you lose money due to inflation. Inflation, you know, has to do with the buying power of money. You know, if you have $100 now and $100 a year from now, you'll still have your $100, but what will you be able to buy with it? About 90 bucks worth of stuff because inflation is, is eating it up. So different types of investments we'll go through, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate. Um, I've talked already about crypto. There's, there's other investments out there too, but uh, risk. Risk is, it's related to return. You're not gonna get uh, any kind of return unless there's a certain amount of risk involved. So uh, risk tolerance is something that you have to evaluate on your own and decide what you can handle. But too much risk is a bad thing, but too little risk is, is just as insidious because it won't keep up with inflation and your money will dissolve. Um, next, retirement planning. So there's lots of tax reasons to save for retirement because it's, you know, it's got a favorable status in terms of the tax system, but there's ways to get at that money too when you're still in your pre-retirement age. If you just pull the money out, yeah, you're going to get penalized. There's going to be some other nasty things. But to borrow against it, for example, borrow against your 401k is, is one of the smartest things you can do. Estate planning. So, you know, it's a gamble. You always want to have more money than you don't want to run out of money. So in all likelihood, there's going to be money left over when you pass away. I mean, ideally, if you knew the day you were going to die, you would, you know, spend the last dollar on the way out the door. That being said, you know, you're not leaving anything for your for your relatives. But anyway, it, life is too uncertain. You don't have that kind of fidelity in planning. So you're going to have to have a little extra in case you, you know, fortunately live a little longer, which means there's probably going to be some left over upon your death. And how you take care of that when you're still alive uh, will determine uh, how much your heirs get. Enhance your net worth, build your wealth. So th this course isn't about greed. I mean, there's some truisms out there that, you know, if you don't worry about money, you're going to worry a lot about money because you're not going to be good with it. And you're going to be obsessed with money. You know, it's, it's like trying to go on a diet and all you can think about is food because you're constantly thinking about your diet and food. If you squander your money and get behind and, and now you know, the bank or whoever is making decisions for you, that's not a good thing. So um, anyway, uh, to, to be able to live comfortably, to have that sort of peace of mind, to be able to, you know, take care of your children and significant other, if you go that way, that's, that's important too. And uh, so anyway, to be comfortable, you, you need money. Cash inflows, so it can be income, uh, outflows, obviously talked about taxes, talked about just regular expenses, and liquidity. You want most of your money ideally invested, and then you want some liquidity to cover unforeseen expenses or just day-to-day -day expenses. So you always want to, should strive to, to manage your money so that you don't have a lot of cash money just sitting idly by um, being you know adversely affected by inflation budgeting yep um, some people will have a steady income other people will be more gig or or you know based upon the job or their income may vary greatly Ideally, you know, we, we did, at least from a financial perspective, would have that old life where you went to work for, you know, GM and you worked there 30 years and you had a big pension and everything was super predictable. It may not be the most exciting life, but from a financial perspective, you'd be able to plan around it. Now, the way people switch jobs, the way the employers, you know, go away, go, go bankrupt or start up, you want that sort of cushion so that you're not job locked or not even location locked, you know. Sometimes, you know, it makes more sense to relocate. But if you're in debt, 
uh, you don't necessarily have that flexibility. And even if you don't execute your you know, exit strategy and go somewhere else or quit your job or do whatever, the peace of mind knowing that you could is, is huge. So, uh, budgetary decisions, yep. So this is just sort of a broad overview if you haven't got to it yet, that we're just kind of talking about things just at the surface level and we'll dive more into these as, as the course goes on. So your job, your income, your cash, products, services, spending. Yep. Hopefully, this whole thing with your income being focused on your job, hopefully there's a bigger bubble out here that'll be your investments. Nobody got really rich working for somebody else. I mean, people are only going to pay you, well, they're never going to pay you what you're worth because that wouldn't make sense. I mean, if, if they're always going to, your output at your job, just mathematically, you know, your, your benefit to that company needs to be larger than your salary or else, you know, they wouldn't hire you. So it's kind of a little bit to wrap your head around, but, but, uh, Ultimately, you know, there's lots of opportunities if you have uh, either investments at her or maybe some sort of side hustle develops into a, uh, you know, self-employment type thing. But if you can get yourself to a position where you're not dependent on an employer and deriving your own money, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Excess cash. We'll talk a little bit about this. Um, what you should do though, ideally, is pay yourself first. So the notion of excess cash, in my mind, is excess cash after investing. Let's say you set aside, you know, it's easier to usually work with percentages. So let's say your goal is whatever your paycheck is, 10% of it's gonna go into investing. Well. Now, if there's money left over at the end of the month, now that is truly excess money because you've got your investments taken care of. So that's more realistic. If you think you've got excess money, but you've done nothing for you know saving for retirement, investing, or whatever, I, I would say, no, you don't have excess cash yet. But if you've already put up, if you've, you know, you've got your rent, let's say whatever, you know, 1500 a month, and you've got your, your uh, um, investing money that's, I don't know, maybe 500 bucks a month, something like that. Um, I don't know why that slide just switched. Um, then, yeah, that money that's left over after your investments are taken care, of, taken care of, that is excess cash. If you're not even making it, if you've got a cash deficiency, well, then you've got a problem. You gotta get back and live within your means. Um, if it's a one-off thing, hopefully you had some sort of emergency fund or, or at least a credit card without a balance on it that you can, um, you know, put that broken transmission or whatever, roll that expense onto that credit card or, or pull that money out of your savings. And it's a, you know, a one-off deal and you can get everything paid off before you start paying interest on it. That's a good thing. But um, if you're already, because of, just daily living, you're in a cash deficiency, then you, you have to, you have to change something because that's not sustainable. Should you lease a car? We'll, we'll talk more about all these kind of things, but the easy answer to that is no. Borrow money to purchase a car? Well, it depends what the deal is, but yeah, a lot of times. Borrow money to purchase a house? Almost always because it's an asset that's that's going up. If you save to purchase a home um, and just want to buy it in cash, financially, you, you're going to come out on the short end of the stick on that in almost all cases. Uh, how much cash we need to borrow? We talk more about that, borrow the funds. Anyway, these are deeper questions. They like this slide. Protecting your wealth, insurance, yep, yep, yep. Makes sense in certain cases, other times not so much. We'll talk about this, assess what your risk tolerance is. 
I find that most students are way more cautious. Certainly way more cautious than I was. But uh, I don't know. It may, be, uh, may work out for you, but in inflationary times, oof, holding on to cash is, is uh, not a good thing. We'll see when, you know, if if situation changes, but, but right now inflation is historically high. How much you put toward retirement, what types of investments, we'll talk more about this. So hopefully, you know, that one bubble of your investments from retirement is huge it should dwarf the amount of money you're making from your income at that point and when you retire you should be able to to live quite well we'll talk about social security you'll have to address it in your plan but just to leave it at if you're planning on existing on social security it's not going to be pretty i have some people who worked for me before and their primary income was social security and without the income that they got from working on jobs with me, they, they would have very, very little. Everything is integrated. Yep. Yep. So this person's in that deficiency state, you know, attempt to work more hours. Yeah, good luck with that. You can only do that for so long, especially as you get older. It's just not a great strategy. Withdraw cash from savings, again, a short run approach. A loan, you're already in debt and you're gonna get a loan, not good. Insurance policy, I would never buy an insurance policy that has a cash value, so that's a non-starter with me. Sell some of your investments. Again, not a great long-term strategy. Withdraw funds, yeah. And that's gonna be penalized as well, and that is your investment, so main issue is if you're in this sort of situation and it's going to be a long-term situation you need to adapt somehow um, but but setting yourself up you know obviously you're taking a college course so you're getting through college which should give you some enhancement to your income and hopefully keep you out of this situation but if you're undisciplined in your spending there's there's no way your income is going to be able to keep up with your spending Uses of cash. Obviously, yeah. Why they put that number five in a personal finance course? You know, they want to, first off, they want to buy stuff. They want to put it in a liquid asset. No. Pay interest payments on a loan. Depends what the interest is. If it's a credit card, certainly. If it's a, a home loan with, you know, two and three quarters percent, no way. So, anyway. Make insurance payments. You should be making your insurance payments. You should be relying on some windfall to help you out with that. And contribute towards your retirement account. These two are going to be fairly well integrated. Kind of busy. But anyway, we're, we're just at such a, a surface level, it's, it's hard to get too much out of this. The main thing if, if you understand nothing from this lecture other than the time value of money you you're well ahead opportunity cost is important too paying yourself first another key key thing so budgeting decisions affect liquidity yep yep yeah, they're talking about the integration of all these different components. Yep, everything they say is true. Psychology, well, yeah, you know yourself better than anybody else. Uh, but yeah, if you're a huge spender, if you, you know, I mean, it's natural. But, but, man, get a dog. Do something else. Find somewhere else to, to go do re retail therapy and buy a bunch of useless stuff is, is not a great way to go through life. Um, 
But anyway, sometimes you can, you know, I've, I've had, when I was in Europe, I always had nice cars. I mean, great cars, expensive cars, but they were never brand new. And I always made money when I sold them. You know, I had, oh, I don't know, five or six Corvettes, a, a Dodge Viper, a um, bunch of cars like that. And uh, I'd always, you know, buy them. And they weren't my primary driver. But I definitely had them to take out on the Audubon or wherever I was going. And uh, anyway, so you, you can spend and enjoy at the same time, but you just got to be smart about it. Oh, yeah, living within your means. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life, but when I was in college, yeah, I had tons of roommates. I didn't have... I don't even think I had a car there for part of it. And uh, it was the greatest time of my life. You know, I got by with nothing and whatever. If, if you can afford to do that in college, that's that's great. I realize college is more expensive now, but having your own place and putting all on loans and doing all that, if you can avoid it, it will help you out later in life. Credit card bills. I use credit cards for pretty much everything but I don't carry a balance, so convenience user. But it's easier because most of my stuff is business related. It's so much easier for me to track my expenses that way uh, and also kind of budget. I can go back and see if I, you know, all of a sudden all my money's gone. I kind of know where it all went because I can look at the credit card transactions and see, you know, what went right, what went wrong. Now they're just getting off, kind of preaching. I, I'm trying to avoid that, although I've already done a fair amount of it tonight. Um, so homework. So get the textbook. Don't don't be stressed if you can't get the textbook immediately. Um, the homework is turned in as a batch assignment at the uh, before each test. So you've got you know a month or two before you need to turn in this homework. It'll be hand it in as a single document, uh, the first half of the homework, and then before the final, the second half of the homework. So, um, We've talked a little bit about this. You can go back through there, look at those charts. But, um, yeah, the, next week we'll, we'll start diving down into more specifics. But this could be a, a good course for you, you know, if you... If you kind of get into it, it can kind of be fun. I mean, spending money is fun, but, but making money, at least for me, is, is more fun. So, and when, especially when you can buy cool things, but if they're cool things that are appreciating assets. Appreciating means they gain value over time. Depreciating means they lose value over time. So, you know, the extreme cases of this are a new vehicle. If you go right out on the showroom floor and buy something, you're going to be underwater. That vehicle is not worth what you paid for it for, well, it's never going to be worth what you paid for it, but it's not even worth anything close to it, you know, for for some time. Um, whereas most real estate and uh, other investments, but other investments like, you know, I've talked about classic cars sometimes, maybe airplanes, guns, I don't know, rugs, you know, Persian rugs, things like that, different things people invest in. Uh, that takes a lot more skill, but there's there's opportunities to make money on that as well. Anyway, we'll talk more about investing. We'll talk more about pretty much all of the topics we talked about tonight. This was just sort of a, a broad overview, um, and uh, it'll be up on YouTube. The syllabus will be up there. The Excel spreadsheets will be up there. There'll be two videos. Don't get confused. You, you know, you've got the one that's the lecture video that you know, you can leave a comment on it. I don't know that I'll I'll read it, but I will certainly read the uh, the uh, or at least make sure you did it. The uh, reaction to to the short video tonight is this guy who moves his hands around in a funny manner and he talks about the value of paying yourself first. And again, you don't have to write me a, a short story on that. Just yeah, this guy's kind of I understand what he's saying or whatever. A one sentence, two sentences, and. and that's good. Um, and then we'll get more into it as the course goes along. But I just wanted to get this out since it is the uh, first day of the course.
talk to you next week.